welcome back. For those of us joining us live, we apologize that we had technical difficulties in session one. We did get it recorded and we'll post it for everybody uh, sometime later this week. But uh, we want to spend some time in the Word uh, this morning. And uh, I think uh, there's a fitting scripture for us in Job 42. So why don't you go to Job 42? We're going to start with verse 1. Uh, but I want to lay a little context as we go there. Um, I look forward to the day that we do a chapter-by-chapter chapter commentary on the book of Job. We've done uh, a brief session kind of disassembling the book of Job uh, to help people understand it, to help people not be afraid of it. The subject of a new episode of the TV show is going to link people to that because it's definitely a place where people get um, scared when it comes to the text. If God can do all that stuff to Job, how does he... Uh, how, what prevents him from doing it to me? And there's answers to those questions. But to link this to some of the stuff we were talking about in the previous session, there's nothing, no error, no heresy, no wrong teaching that the Holy Spirit didn't forethink when it came to designing the integrated message system that is the Word of God. And that is why you can get as theologically minded as you want to. If you don't understand the integrity of the design, you will miss out. Uh, in fact, that has always been one of the core premises of uh, how I try to teach the Word of God. But the further I get into a career of doing that, the more I realize how absolutely important it is. Understanding that everything in the book is there by deliberate design, even though it was crafted by many different people over a vast amount of time, it was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. There are tons of theologians that don't believe that. And yet they still put Christian after their name, or they put PhD of this, or master of this, and they write books and books and books and books. Um, and there's a big, you know, uh, 50 cent vocabulary word out there. The word is a pedant, or somebody who is pedantic. And if you're not familiar with that word, that just means all book learning, no street smarts, no practical application. You, you learned it in a school, but you haven't actually put it to use, okay? So if you hear me use that word, that's what it means. By and large, the book of Job is not about all the stuff that happens to Job in the book. By and large, the book is not about whether God allowed it to happen to Job or whether... Uh, Satan did it to Job. We handle all of those things elsewhere. Do you know what the bulk of the book about, is about? It's Job and three theologian friends sitting around talking about God. That's the biggest chunk of the book. It is nothing but men debating their opinion of God. And the reason that that's so profound to us is what happens at the end of the book. God shows up and says, you're all wrong. And honestly, that should terrify every one of us. That should be one of the biggest motivators we ever have to really know him. Sue's came to me at the break. In fact, I'll go over there and just we talk about this scripture a lot. But John 17, Jesus says in verse 3, he says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, that's red letters in my Bible, so that means Jesus Christ is referring to himself in the third person there. He's a king. He has the right to do that. My nephew is going on three years old. He re 
refers to himself in the third person all the time. What's your name? I Tosh. Are you a goofy little kid? No, I Tosh. Third person all the time. Jesus here, it says eternal life is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Emmanuel, God with us, the anointed of God whom you sent. Eternal life does not start after your funeral. Eternal life starts now. You can exist in a place where you know eternity. And that's why I said I want you to go to Job 42. We're going to start at verse 1. And it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, and here in verse 3, Job is repeating things that God has asked of him in the preceding chapters. Who is this who hides counsel with knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, Job says. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Verse 4 says, Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you, and you shall answer me. Verse 5 is so key. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. There are theologians that will tell you Job never did anything wrong. No, Job messed up. If you follow the course of the narrative of the book of Job, he was innocent when everything was happening to him. But somewhere along the course of the, way, the, the, the story of the book, Job got more concerned with defending his own righteousness than he did with defending the character and nature of God. That was part of his problem. So when he describes and talks about God with his theological buddies, and God comes down and basically declares everything that they've said to be poppycock and tomfoolery. Job says, I thought I knew you. But I, all I ever did was hear about you. I was, you have to forgive me, I'm kind of following the leading of the Holy Spirit as I go here. Because I did just marinate in the Word of God this morning, you know. There's this big, I got a, I got a question from an online viewer a while back. Do you support once saved, always saved? Or are you, you know, which side? They, they always want to know what side. That's one of the big questions. And what people who ask that question don't even know is they're actually asking, are you a Calvinist or are you an Armenian? That's the, that's the question. <clears throat> and I said, well, no, we do believe the Bible shows that you can be a reprobate, but the problem is the Bible also shows a whole lot of verses that says neither height nor depth nor power nor things present nor things to come. Nothing can pluck you from my hand. In fact, Jesus' prayer in John 17, where we were just a minute ago, talks about how Jesus doesn't lose anyone except the son of perdition that was given to him and that the father won't lose anyone that is his. It becomes, as one teacher I know, if it becomes a situation of, yes, you're both right. You can't lose your salvation and you can walk away. Well, how does that happen? Well, the problem is, in all of these theological debates, we come down to things like this. We just start equivocating on terms. While one side of the debate, you'll see where I'm going with this in a second, but where one side of the debate would say, well... We realize that Christians can sin. But if Christians sin and they wind up walking away from their faith, what that actually means is they were never really saved in the first place. And then the other side of the debate says, well, people can be genuinely saved, but they can become reprobate or they can apostatize. They can walk away from their faith and they can give up. Nothing can stop God from saving you or take you out of God's hand except yourself. 
And the scholars debate this because the scripture presents a, a, a version of the text that, that shows that, that no man can pluck you from the hand of God. Well, if you're a man, you can't pluck yourself from the, the, the sight of God. So they argue it that, that you just must never have really been saved if you walk away from God. The other side says, well, you may have really been saved, but you apostatized and you walk away from God. It's the same result. We're equivocating over terms. One side says you were saved and walk away. The other side says, well, you claim to be a Christian, but you really weren't. When it comes down to the brass tacks, what's different? And again, it comes down to this issue. We know that Jesus says in the book of Matthew that in that day there will be many that say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do all of these mighty works? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Have you ever thought of Jesus' statement? Depart from me, I've never known you in conjunction with his definition of eternal life from John 17, 3? Have you ever thought about eternal life and Job's ultimate conclusion that led him to repentance? He, was, he is referred to at the beginning of the book as a righteous man. The entire reason Satan is going about to and fro throughout the earth is he's considering God's servant Job and, and Satan is under the misconception that God has put a hedge of protection over Job's life and there's nothing that he can do to bother Job. And Job says, dude, you're the God of this world. All that he has is in your hands. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Jesus hadn't come yet. We do not live today, praise God, the way Job lived thousands of years ago. We live in a place where the dominion, authority, power, responsibility that Adam had belongs to Jesus, and nothing can happen to take that away. When Satan comes and wants to bother us, we have the right, because of a victorious Savior, to say, get out of here. Job didn't. God had to be honest because God is not a man that he should lie. He says, look, all that he has is in your hand, but don't touch his body. Satan decides to push the envelope. God says, you can touch his body, but you will not kill him. People think that was giving permission. They forget that when Jesus talked to Peter, he says, oh, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. How many remember that scripture? Problem is, English changes over time. Look up, go to Bible Hub, look up that verse. You'll see translations that actually get it right. It says, Satan has demanded the right to sift you as wheat. That's what the Greek says. He didn't ask permission. He asserted a right, and Jesus hadn't died yet. Ergo, the God of this world, the thief of dominion, he had the right to test Peter. Then we get to the book of James and it says, God tempts no man. James, he's writing at a time when Jesus is already out of the tomb. And that's good news. Satan asks to sift you. You can say, nah, pass. Because you know what? It isn't my righteousness. You sift me. The only thing that's going to fall out is Jesus. Because that's the only thing you get to count, bud. See ya. It's a different scenario. But the thing that led Job to repentance was I heard about you. I didn't know you.
This is a church that demands study from its students, and you guys are all students. I had conversations with students in the past couple weeks where I had to encourage them to go beyond the easy, the comfortable, the things that are fun, the certain teachers that we like to listen to. Why did I have to do that? Because they got into it with somebody who came from a different religious background and, oh, wait, that teacher doesn't help you defend what you believe. They just say what they believe. I never really had a use for apologetics. You were never actually trying to stand up and teach anything before. When you stand up for what you believe, people who don't believe like you will challenge you, and that's when listening to the fun stuff, the easy stuff, stops. And you got to dive into some of the pain in the butt stuff that I'm teaching you. To be able to defend it. We demand study. We demand that you go beyond just a daily devotional, my utmost for his highest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We demand you get into the word and study it because we know that if we do that, you will learn sound doctrine, you will learn discipleship, you will learn discernment, and through that you will have the ability to defend what you believe. But let me tell you what, as much as those are pillars of our ministry, as much as those are pillars of our focus, as much as we will not abandon them, we also have to know what it is to dwell in the presence of God. We also have to know what it is to be in that place with him so we can never be guilty of saying, well, I've heard about you, but I didn't know you. We cannot afford to subsist on regurgitated revelation. The greatest sign that I'm a failure in ministry is if when you guys go out to defend your faith, you say, well, Matt says, The greatest sign that I'm a success in ministry is when you go out to defend your faith, you turn to a page in your Bible and you say what the Bible says. I do not care if I'm forgotten. But if you're equipped to go out and to defend yourself with what the Word of God says, not out of a pedantic sense of academic learning, but out of a righteous, passionate desire desire to lead people to a deeper understanding of who they are in Christ. Then we've accomplished something. Then you will never come to the place where you have to repent because you thought you knew something about God. Loud for everybody, huh? You're spot on. So for those of us online who couldn't hear, one of our teens was just saying they, they had the opportunity to get to know uh, a couple of Mormon kids, and, and it impacted them when it was shared with them that it's not a religion about God, it's a relationship with God. And see, the thing is, we can dovetail that, because this past year, as Michelle learned how to defend her faith to somebody that was a Muslim, they have no sense that God loves them. They have no sense that they can have a personal relationship with Christ. But you know what? We cannot afford 
too assume. And we just need to be reminded of this before we go out of here. This needs to be a focus that's, that's a part of our year. We cannot afford to assume that Christians know what it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What does that mean? As I was talking with somebody at the break, there are those who have book knowledge, theological knowledge, they can debate, they can, they can have all the skills of critical thinking that we admonish you to have, that we train you to have, but that can become a ditch because they can begin to assume that the other side of that ditch, there's this group of holy rollers who operates with no critical thinking skills whatsoever, and they are just blown about by whatever they feel the Holy Spirit is telling them to do that day. And their interpretation of the Word of God isn't subject to any sound theory of interpretation. It's just what God spoke to them. And that becomes absolute flakiness. And so therefore, one side sees the other side as empty and shallow and not having anything. And then the other side looks at the other side as complete. You know, you put them in a freezer and what you got is frosted flakes. The problem is we can't afford to jump into either ditch. The river of life flows between the banks of two extremes. And we, as mature disciples of Christ, cannot ever abdicate having an intense relationship with God where we get to talk to him and he talks to us because he did it all so he could have relationship with you. But the reason we hold that in check is because the enemy likes to come in and deceive people into thinking they are hearing from God and people don't, are not raised up to be able to discern the truth with the skills that the other side has to keep something from becoming heresy, to keep something from becoming weirdness. There is a way to have the best of both worlds. That's what biblical Christianity is all about. Knowing God and being a diligent student. Because what does the Bible say? The Bible says, study diligently to show yourself approved. Both statements are in the text. And so we don't just get to have our, you know, don't, don't, don't settle this year for just getting your four chapters in and your chronological Bible reading for the day. You're not going to grow as a believer if that's all you do. But at the same time, I'm not telling you you got to spend 14 hours a day. I know you got to work. I know you got kids to raise. It is an attitude of constant learning. It is an attitude of saying right now, you know, start, start your year out with some questions you have about the Bible. Write them down. Take an hour or two or this next week and just write things down that you don't understand about the text right now and then let's go back and look at that journal 12 months from now and see what we've been able to cross off that list because we should be able to mark that growth in your personal life you should be able to get answers you shouldn't just be left wandering in your faith there are so many Christians that exist in the church today that have served the same, that have served God the same way for 30 years. And they're not any further in their faith than they were 30 years ago. And God doesn't want that for you. But you have to be proactive about it because it's not going to just happen. Remember the parable of the talents and your ability to under your mind. Your ability to study is a talent. It's one of them that you have. The only person that the master got upset with is the one who went and buried his talent in the backyard and didn't put it to any effort or any risk. All the others he was proud of because they grew. God doesn't want you to be stagnant in 2021. What? happens with stagnant water. Well, I know one of the things, it becomes putrid. It becomes dead, right? The Bible's example of living water was water that was moving. 
One of the things that happens in this fallen world with stagnant water is it becomes a breeding ground for bloodsuckers, disease spreaders, death carriers. You don't want that in your spiritual life. So you have to be resolved to do what Paul said to Timothy and constantly stir up that gift that is in you. And then this is the thing, okay? This is how you turn it all around and then we're going to close. And I really just felt like this morning was admonishing everybody to be in the word, to stay in the word, to be focused, to, to participate in our studies, but to ask questions. When we started this church, we had this thing. Some people don't like to ask questions out loud. So let's go back to that thing where if you have a question, you don't want to ask it out loud, write it down right here. I'll read it as we come back to the break. And then you're anonymous if that's what it takes. But do what Paul said to Timothy and stir up the gift that is in you. In other words, this year, there's no condemnation. But instead of getting bummed out or feeling stagnant, when you feel your flesh say, oh, I don't feel like it, you turn that around as a sign that's saying, ah, that's my alarm bell. I need to carve out some time. I need to be in the word. I need to marinate in it for a week. And when I marinate in it, it doesn't mean I just sit there and read it. It means I hear it, and sometimes I just play it again. Sometimes I circle back to it. I just keep my mind in it. Sometimes I just, my, my parents and Michelle, they'll, they'll tell you, I just wander around thinking about it. Most of the time, I'm picking up stuff that doesn't belong to me and setting it down places I don't remember. By all means, just teenagers, just think of that as another way to annoy your parents in Jesus' name. But be in the word and be focused on those things. Don't let work, don't let school, don't let the cares of this world. We have the choice of whether or not we make 2021 better than 2020 by what we choose to do with his word. It is all on you. But I guarantee if that is your priority, Casey said she's focusing on priorities this year. If that is your priority, 2020 will be a distant memory. And 2021 will be in our lives. No matter what happens in the world, people will look at you and they go, what is wrong with you that you are shining and the rest of this year is just craptastic? We want better than that. How do we have what you have? But it doesn't happen by accident. You have to be proactive. Don't be a bunch of theologians that just sit around and discuss what they think they know about. Be active, participate, ask questions. Because when that happens, even just that simple act of asking a question, look at how God got Job involved. I tell you what, some of these people, I'm, I'm sorry, I got to say this. Some of these people in the theological groups that I'm at, they cannot stand when you ask leading questions to try to take them somewhere to get them to draw the conclusion for themselves. Just state what you mean and I'll critique it. They say it all the time. I ain't asking you to critique what I believe. I'm trying to get a light bulb to go off inside of your head. And I know that if, it's, if a light bulb goes off inside of your head because you get there on your own, it'll be something that you retain. I'm trying to do you, but they get so mad about it because they just want to take apart your ideas. Look at how God interacted with Job. He asked him questions. He led him to the answer. He drew him. God could have showed up in the whirlwind and just said, this is how it is. But he asked Job questions. He asked him questions questions that led him to the answer because it was meaningful when it went off inside of his mind for the first time. It stuck with him. It led him to repentance because in a lot of those questions, what Job came to realize is he did not have the answer. And sometimes, I mean, look at the gospel message, if nothing else. 
Sometimes it's about asking questions just to prove to somebody they don't have the answer to get them to realize they need Jesus. Does that make sense? I'm trying to fill you guys with hope this morning. God has an awesome, awesome, awesome year planned out for us, but you got to participate. You can't be a spectator. you got to put yourself in this. Don't say for a minute that you want to be in the same place right now that you're, that you're in in 2022. That you, you, you have to have a mentality about your faith that says you are going to grow and then do something about it. Because if you do, all the crud that 2020 was, all the crud that 2019, all of that kind of stuff, God has put it in your hands. He has blessed you, and he's given you the strength to prosper and to have good success. But it starts with the word. Because the word will change all your other attitudes to everything else if you let it. Does that make sense? Close with prayer. Father, I pray for those who, like Job's friends, are just empty academicians, book smart, no heart. Father, I pray for those who are easily deceived because they think they see demons around every corner or they think everything in their life is a divine appointment and they have no discernment. Father, I pray that this body of believers would be a body of believers that is rooted and grounded in the faith. That doesn't just know about your word, but understands how to live out your word. That doesn't just know about you, but knows you. And can stand with confidence when knocking at the door that Jesus is going to say, come on in, I've been waiting for you to get here. Not depart from me, I don't know you. Those are our prayers, God. May 2020 be the best year of our spiritual growth and growth in every other direction because we put our spiritual growth first. You are in charge of the rest. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Guys, the offering is in the back. Michelle and I took a look at the schedule uh, and it just so happens, even though that we just came back, that next week would be a Circle Sunday. Um, and it appears if we keep that schedule, that everything falls in line for our calendar, the Memorial Days, the 4th of July weekends, the uh, Labor Days that we usually try to take off. It appears that if we just keep our schedule, um, that all of that will line up without having to do contrivances later on to make that fit our schedule. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a circle Sunday next week and then begin a new live cycle and let that kind of organize our calendar for us this year. So that's a little bit weird, but I'd rather just get it out of the way now, early in the year. And um, that will also allow Michelle and I to work on some other stuff before she's got to go back to college. So um, that's the plan. No live service next week. But for the following rotation, please get on um, the setup and uh, volunteer, maybe if you haven't yet, that's something you can do in 2021 to help serve. Please be faithful givers. You give not to me. Uh, you give to this ministry because this is where you're fed. That's a biblical mandate. Um, it's it's uh, a path of showing, just like fasting is saying no to your flesh, giving is saying, God, you can do more with 90% in my life than I can do with 100%. Don't deny God the right to bless you in that sense. So we love you. Go with God. And we will see you, local family, next week. Online, we will see you in two weeks. Be blessed.